Hello and welcome to episode three of the Herald's Horn, your home for Magic the Gathering news and hopefully some fun too. It is January 31st and today we are going to be talking about the Brazil and European Regional Championship tournaments, functional rules changes for Magic cards, and also a little bit about the growth of the CDH tournament scene. Of course, we also have the product watch and since I usually determine everything we talk about on the Herald's Horn, I am also introducing a new segment called the Co-Hosts Notebook, where whichever co-hosts are joining me that week can talk about a single topic of their choice. After the break, I have Jim from the Commander Rules Committee to talk about EDH in 2023 and 2024, ongoing Rules Committee projects, and what is up next for EDH in general. I also asked him about his first full year on the Rules Committee as one of the first new members added in a very long time. It's a great interview and you are going to love it. Let's get into the episode. Hello, you are listening to episode number three of The Herald's Horn. It's been an exciting two weeks in the realm of Magic the Gathering, and we're here to break it down for you. My name is Cal Jones, and today I am joined by the wonderful Emma. Say hello, Emma. Hello, Emma. And I am also joined today by Dan. Say hello, Dan. Hello, Callahan Jones. Wait a second. <laughs> Did I mix it up this week? Wait a yeah. second. We mix it up. We're mixing it up. So um, how, how are you two on this fine, illustrious Monday, January 29th? Happens to be my birthday. But um, happy birthday, Cal. Thank you. What is like little flex in there? Like unavoidable that we have to now say happy birthday to Cal. <laughs> Thank you. On your podcast. Thank you. <laughs> so how's your day going? Just so happens to be my birthday today. <laughs> yeah, it just so happens to be my birthday. Hopelessly alone. My wife has been gone all day and uh, I worked. Play the theme song. <laughs> and welcome back it is time for the herald's horn news where i and dan and emma walk you through some of the stuff that's uh, gone on over the last two weeks of course some of the biggest headlines uh from the last two weeks were just from this last weekend we had both the european and brazilian regional championships um the format of course being modern um the uh european regional championship was won by marco del pivo i hope i'm saying that correctly um on team of rhinos uh and he also gets to move on he gets a world's qualification obviously he's qualified for the pro tour exciting times um yeah emma anything interesting happened at the this this regional championship beyond just uh, Teamer Rhinos, a deck that everyone loves to hate, uh, taking down this modern tournament. So it's not surprising to see Pivo win this European Championship because they were also the top eight Pro Tour uh, competitor of Pro Tour Lord of the Rings, which was also a modern Pro Tour. And he was also playing Teamer Rhinos. It was pretty much the same list outside of a couple of Tishana's Tide Binders. So it's not very, su- not very surprising to see Pivo like, crush it. It's great. Um, there was plenty of discourse around uh, some shuffling, I hear, at Ghent, where the regional championships took place uh, on coverage. But there was some suspicious sh- shuffling with a grief and how it didn't matter. <laughs> yeah, so they put out a really weird statement. The, the, the people who are running the tournament put out this really weird statement because, you know, this happened on coverage. Awkward. They said, a concerning situation happening on camera was brought to the attention of the head judges of the regional championship at legacy european championship ghent is that also the correct pronunciation g h e n t excellent wing in the pronunciation today after a careful analysis of the situation the head judges concluded that the player did not commit cheating what happened was a player was randomizing their library um, they obviously like pulled a grief from some point in their library, like up to the top and then shuffled their library a few more times. Uh, either the top card did not move that grief either did not move or it moved by just a few cards. 
And then the player uh, was like, here, cut my deck. <laughs> so um, it's a bit of a weird situation. And uh, obviously the head judges ruled that cheating wasn't involved. It was just a weird thing that happened, perhaps an accident. Um, but it is yet another one of these, like, in quotes, cheating scandals, maybe at these big tournaments where it seemed like many judges who were talking about it uh, were supporting the head judge, saying that, like, it's a suspicious act, could be an accident. They didn't think it amounted to cheating, kind of easy to fix. And then there were many players talking about it that were like, yeah, but even if it's suspicious, you should just like DQ the guy just in case. Uh, it's a weird era in Magic the Gathering tournament policy. Dan, as our resident um, OP, organized play Magic tournament policy expert, do you have any thoughts? Um, about this situation should the head judge have ruled that this person who put a grief on top of their deck and did not shuffle well should they have been DQ'd in your professional level 5 judge opinion in my opinion I think that would be a grief just Hey, I I, th I was really sitting on that. <laughs> and one. that's I thought about all we have <laughs> for this episode of the Herald Swarm podcast. No, <laughs> uh, no, I think I, it's a very delicate situation because the, I guess it comes down to can you prove uh, this player's intent in that situation? And I guess uh, to some degree, maybe you can. Um, who was asking for the cut maybe is like a determining factor you could look at in that sort of situation. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, it got cut. If this is not a thing that was like persistent throughout the day, I don't know. It seems like it does seem egregious, I think, to DQ based on that singular action. If that was the one time where we saw this happening. And again, the announcement is a very concerning situation in which cheating did not happen. Yeah. And I, I the weird thing was like it happened on stream and then like they felt the need to mention it online. I totally understand like, that because just... lots of people are going to miss the fact that maybe the yes. shuffling happened afterwards or something like that. And of course, people are going to start hitting you on Twitter being like, what is going on? Screenshots, no context, everything like that. So totally makes sense to make that statement. Uh, but it seems like it would be a little bit. I don't know. It's it's a delicate situation because there is money and prizes on the line and all of that. So high stakes situation. I understand people uh, being critical of it. Yeah, and it's just one of those awkward situations where we pay judges to be good at this judgment calls, and the judge made the judgment call, and we have to move on with our day. Um, yeah, that's another thing is that, yeah, this is a person who we're entrusting to this position. They've made their call, and what are they there for if not to make these calls, right. and then uh, that is the calling. And uh, for legal reasons, Dan is, in fact, not an L5 judge. No, I'm a level 69. Hey. Uh, moving over to the Brazilian <laughs> RC. Um, uh, it was won by Rakdos Scam in the hands of uh, Gelheme Merham. I, I can't pronounce that one either. I am, I am too bad at this. Uh, but Brazilian RC taken down by Rakdos Scam. Um, turns out that being able to cast the grief, especially maybe if you're shuffling it to the top of your library, um, is really, really uh, good. Um, even a Furious banned, post Fury banning, I've even heard some people say that uh, not having to mess around with Fury in your deck has made for some much better scam decks than existed beforehand as they uh, got forced to innovate some new stuff. But um, very interesting to see Rakio Scam take that down. And um, I. I'm interested to see if anything about that deck necessitates any more changes or if we'll see the modern format get shaken up at all before, of course, it is forcibly rotated by the release of Modern Horizons 3 in the coming year. Right, Emma? Is it is it coming out this year? Is, if I've done my maths correctly, it will be mid-June because okay. the Pro Tour is the end of June. So it's okay. either going to be the June 14th or June 21st. All right. That's it's my nearly... maths. The new hit it, hit modern first. format is nearly upon us. Will Grief still be playable on June 16th or June Will 21st? Will Modern still be playable? <laughs> Will Modern still be playable? <laughs> that's the clip. That's that's the YouTube shirt right there. We'll have to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll have to we'll have to uh, table this conversation <clears throat> until we talk about it in our product watch six months from now. 
Um, also, big news that happened over specifically this weekend. Actually, all of the notable things that I could think of happened over this weekend, so that's fun. Um, they announced that with the release of Murder at Karlov Manor, Karlov Manor, Murder at Karlov Manor, <laughs> The new Magic the <laughs> Gathering set, there will be a functional rules change, a functional rules errata to uh, change how the mechanics of Suspend works. Historically, how Suspend worked was when you took the last Suspend counter off of your card, you had to, you were forced to cast the spell. Um, no matter what, you had to cast the spell. You did not have the option of not casting the spell. Um, they are changing that. Now, uh, you have the option. And if you don't cast the spell, it will go into exile. Emma, tell us why this is a terrible change. Everyone online has told me this is a terrible change. Why is this a terrible change? Uh, I don't, is it a terrible change? It's, All right. It feels Dan. like it feels like <laughs> it feels like a change that people didn't realize was a change. Half the people already assumed this was how you play with suspend cards, which you don't, by the way. There's, you know, you have to cast the spell. Uh, a lot of people were thinking uh, in terms of modern and Team of Rhinos and considering Team of Rhinos is probably one of the best decks in modern right now. Um, it has a much, it will have a better burn matchup because Roiling Vortex is so good against Team of Rhinos. And if you can just decide not to cast the suspend card, great. You're saving yourself five life. That's a big, that's a big chunk of change yeah, of a, life that you can just not kill change. yourself. That's a pretty functional change for a matchup that's, Traditionally, not been great for Team of Rhinos, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but the reason Wizards have implemented this change is because basically they couldn't put it into Arena properly; it just couldn't get couldn't get it to work. And considering Arena wants to put more cards in, and there's like you know more sets coming in and more weird and wonderful mechanics, if they can't get it to work on Arena, they have to adjust it somewhere. It's kind of crappy that this is the reason for the change that if they want to add these cards there has to be a compromise somewhere and i feel like given the tools and given how everything is playing out this is the best way to do it they did they also did like trot out some reasoning along the lines of what you alluded to there which was like yeah people a lot of people already assumed that it worked this way anyway so yeah eliminate like suspend, some player confusion sus Suspend's not the most casual friendly mechanic when you think about it either. So this is, it makes it easier for them. I know people are going to complain it's, oh, it's the casual commander players softening up my old magic mechanics, all that kind of thing. It's just literally, they couldn't put it into arena properly. I bet if they could, it would not have been changed. Yeah, it seems better overall to not change it, in my opinion, because I do understand the perspective of uh, it taking away that sort of risk there of like parting the inherent risk of casting cheap spells or cheating the cost on spells is that there is some sort of downside to it. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it is what it is. I think it's a pretty marginal uh, rule change. Like before Team of Rhinos, what was the last Cascade deck? I don't remember what they were. Ca uh, actually, I used to play it. It was um, Restore Balance in Modern. Very. I used to very, play that in Modern as well. I was a very big fan of Restore Balance in Modern, <laughs> come to think of it. So I do know the culprit. Um, but yeah, you know, it's never a deck that's very top tier or anything like that. Like it is right now. Um, and that is something to be talked about. But I don't know. Um, it seems pretty marginal overall. It will be very interesting to see if uh, one of Modern's best decks getting a weird little side grade boost um, will change much of anything. But of course, past that, there is also, I don't know, there's the random effects here and there. I am personally not very convinced by some of the arguments I've seen people try to run out or they're like, yeah, actually magic's better when in this really neat scenario, someone gets blown out by their own suspend spell. Okay. And like, people used it. to... People used to get blown out with mana burn when they cast mana drain. But it's like, that's, you know. It's like, this, it's like Cascade. Like, the whole point of playing Cascade is the randomness of it. But you're take when you take away the randomness, it becomes really good. See Team of Rhinos, see Living End. Like, yep. these things become really good when you, you know, you construct things in a particular way. See Discover cards needing to be immediately banned in formats because a better Cascade is too good. The Cascade <laughs> already was. <laughs> One thing I want to say quickly, that rules change for Suspend, uh, yeah, for Suspend 
uh, happens on Carla Banner release weekend, which is the same weekend as RC Denver, which is also modern. So that is relevant for that weekend. So if you're playing Team Rhinos, congrats, you don't have to cast your suspense spell against a bird deck. Good there job. There we go. The more you know, that is the edge you need when you play against somebody <laughs> who is, for some reason, playing, playing burn. burn still in the year of 2024. If you're playing against Patrick Chapin at uh, at RC Denver. <laughs> 18 Mountains Mono Red Burn. Let's fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on from the suspend rules change. Uh, this is definitely my little note of the week um, of the news here. A little bit more niche. I've tried to avoid talking about CDH much on this program so far, even though that's like definitely my background. Obviously, it's also a big part of uh, Dan's background. I was going to say half of the hosts have really ground our, grinded yeah. our teeth in the content world. Yeah, on this. for sure. For sure. But I've been I've been trying to avoid talking about CDH too much because it definitely is a little more uh, niche compared to the greater Magic the Gathering sphere. Um, but the CEDH tournament scene is continuing to grow. I think that's just really fun. Uh, we had the largest CEDH tournament yet this last weekend, in-person tournament. There's been larger online ones. Um, I believe the final count was 222 players at the Boyle in Atlanta, Georgia. And in classic fashion, the winner was once again Ian, a.k.a. Comedian MTG, um, who took down the field of 222 people with his trusty Kinnon deck. Um, people who say that CDH isn't a skill-based format in shambles, et cetera, et cetera. Ian, uh, absolutely insane tear uh, as a CDH player. Uh, the rest of the top four also included uh, notable players. Max, a.k.a. Wounded Satellite, who's another uh, notable grinder who also wins all the time. And then I don't know his legal name, but also Freedom Waffle. Uh, for all these, all these uh, in-game names, we got to start learning people's names. I thought you were going to start community. reading off his government name, and I was going to no. say, oh, no, that one's freedom." I am, I am, I am doxing Freedom Waffle at this time. Um, but yeah, top four and top sixteen all made up of like killers, the exact same names over and over again at continually larger and larger tournaments. Um, Except for the fourth member of the top four, who is a, uh, this is their very first tournament on uh, Sauron. Yes, the wow. six CMC amass. When you amass wheel Sauron that I thought so was it's a like pre-com one. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is so, the pre-con six minute Sauron. Yeah. So uh, wow. that also made top four in the tournament. So, you know, CDH growing in so many different ways, whether it be player count or uniqueness of decks that we see in the finals. Um, SEG also like uh, tangentially, it seems that CDH 5Ks at SEG cons are here to stay. So mm -hmm. that's good. Exciting times. Um, and that's all I have to say on this topic. Wait, are you Dan, not going to bring up the fact that CDH? LSV finally agreed to uh, play CDH with you? LSV did agree really? to play CDH with me at MagicCon Chicago, given that he has the time, which uh, since I assume he has a lock for day two of the Pro Tour, I will assume he will <laughs> not have the time to play it with me. But he did say if he had the time, he would like to try it out. I, I bet he scrubs out round one. All right, marking that one for the YouTube clips. <laughs> uh, so yeah, CDH scene continues to grow. That's I just wanted to talk about that really quick. Any any thoughts? Anyone? No. See, it, it seems great. Yeah. As someone that doesn't play CDH, it's really cool just to see these niche formats. You know, at, you can actually win. You know, make good money out of just winning these events or winning like power, like Ian has twice. Yeah, you know. two time twisters in the span of a uh, month. Yeah, seems good. Yeah, I'm glad that there's a space for people to uh, compete uh, seriously who want to in these things. Uh, it's an awesome format, and I hope people continue to enjoy it and play it more. All right, that is the end of the news for this week, and that was my little self insert into the podcast this week. And uh, much in that vein, um, I want to give my co-hosts a chance really quick to talk about whatever they want to, what is inside of the co-host notebook. Emma, what's in your co-host notebook? What do you want to talk about? Um, let's talk about what I'm doing like in my life right now. Oh, yeah. So I've been revisiting a lot of old um, like role-playing games, so RPGs on my, on my PC. I have been rinsing through Mass Effect quite a bit. 
I finished Mass Effect 1 in like four days because I was just like hyper focused and remembered like all the things that I needed to do. So I've been enjoying that. I'm on Mass Effect 2 now and then I'll soon play Mass Effect 3. Also, Dan, uh, I, de- I bought the Dead Space remaster today. Yeah. Well. Have you started so playing I'm gonna it? Play that soon. I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish Mass Effect 2 first because I don't like having multiple games going at the same time. Mm, I'm one yeah. of these people. I'm a, a one trick pony in that way. But I'm really excited to play it because the first one was fantastic. It's such a fantastic remake too. It is really, um, I, I think it really captures the what they got right about the atmosphere in two and three that is sort of lacking in one, and all of the little like uh, upgrades of like the just comfort of life, like menu settings and things like that that are oh, so cool. much smoother. Um, but yes, yeah, just absolutely horrifying experience. Everything is so much just better and fresher and fuller. Uh, I'm very excited to hear what you think about it. I am looking forward to playing it with my headphones and just crapping myself for like six hours. I look it's at other people's run times on games like that and they're like seven and a half hours and i'm like 14 and a half hours because i'm just (laughs) in a corner just white knuckled just like oh my god i hope it doesn't find me i too had like my mass effect era where the i the collection was like on sale on the playstation store and i bought it and i said man i have not played these since i was like 13 on my xbox 360 i'm jumping back in and then i like blew through them all in like three months i was like excellent that was awesome. I, I've Can't also, wait to do this again in a decade. I've also ordered the books, like pre-owned, because they released some books uh, like that preludes to Mass Effect One. Um, so it, it tells the story about Saren and like you know how they became a Spectre and all that stuff. So I bought all them, so I'm going to reread that through them at some point as well. So that'll be fun. When I get into something, it's just like I have this everything. I've become like a sponge. So. I'm playing Mass Effect now. I'm going to read the books. I'll probably read some of the comics as well. It makes the entire experience so much more fulfilling when you have right. all those little extra given, things to add on given, to it. Given how lore-heavy Mass Effect is, it mm. just makes it so much better. Well, as we flip the page in the co-host notebook, Dan, have you written anything down in your big book of ideas? <laughs> Uh, no, although ironically, I have been doing a lot of writing uh, recently this past month. A friend of mine have been getting involved in a, uh, I am uh, by training a poet uh, in oh, college. Wow, I didn't know that. Just oh. very little known oh. fact about me. Um, I haven't written in a lot of years, but a friend of mine uh, just recently enticed me to do a month of uh, writing a poem every day. So I'm in the that's middle cool. of that right now. And that's been fun. Uh, it's a sort of, it's a lengthy experience. Once you get to like day 20, you're just always being like, I'm writing a poem right now and it sucks. Um, but that's fine. It's part of the process. Yeah, you like get all of your actual ideas out or whatever, like over the first 10 days. Yeah. And, then... and you know, like the idea is that you sort of walk around in your daily life with your eyes extra open being like, okay, I need to like, I need to experience the thing. I need to see a thing that's interesting today because I need to have something to write about. And then some days just nothing happens and you're like, well, I've written about all of my feelings. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, I have been playing a ton of Timeless on Arena. I know that we're not supposed Ooh. to talk about magic, but that is honestly what I've been doing with a ton of my time. Uh, and I think it's a really fun format. It's, it's very interesting. It's very particular and unique in its power level. And as more sets get released and we get more of the like Strixhaven archives and things like that, like I'm excited to see what uh, really powerful cards get added to it over time. What do you play in Timeless, Dan? I have been playing an Esper Control deck, which I think is like not the move overall, but I have made it up to Mythic, so like it works. Oh, congrats. Uh, a lot of the field is uh, Demir and Rakdos Lurus decks, which makes a lot of sense. Lots of powerful cards in there. Um, but I'm just using Dark Rituals to ramp into either Five Minute to Fairies or Shieldred and the One Ring, um, and then playing like Thought Seas and Brainstorm on top of that. So it's just all good spells that deck. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy playing it a lot. I just wish that it was more accessible to play. That's been the thing keeping it's impossible. me out of it, is that if I want to build any new deck, like I have Tainted Pact because I played it in Historic before Thassa's Oracle was banned in Historic, so I had 80% of the cards I needed. So I just had me the rest, and that's my Timeless deck, but if I ever wanted to play anything else, it would probably run me like 50 wild cards of the it's, rare and yeah. mythic variety. 
It's impossible to get into. Uh, Arena Beta opened when I just moved to Philly and had no one to play Magic with, so I spent a ton of time playing Arena Beta. So I got to draft through all of the, like, um, Return to Ravnica, get all the shocks and things like that. Um, So that has made my entire experience of it a lot easier. Um, Because, yeah, if you're trying to build any deck, if it's, like, what, like 20, 40 rares to build a deck, that's so much either money or time. Especially when stuff like Lightning Bolt is a rare Yep. Just, yes. Like, yes. Well, all the, the strict, spell, dark ritual, also the rare. The haven archives, all archive spells, all being mystical archive spells, all specifically yeah. being like rares is really because that's where a lot of the the juicy power level spells come from, and all of them are rares. Want to play brainstorm? Four rares. Kind of poopy. It surprises me when I see cards like DRC or Mistress Bobble and they like actually keep it as an uncommon. I'm like, oh, there's no reason you could repackage this as a rare. <laughs> well, speaking of spending money on Magic the Gathering cards, it's time for the product watch. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the Product Watch, the recurring segment on the Herald's Horn, where we talk about all of the cards that have come out since the last time we recorded an episode or that have been announced. Of course, since the last episode, we have had the entirety of Murder at Karlov Manor preview season. Uh, my takeaway is cards are actually looking pretty powerful, um, probably because everyone's wearing fedoras. Thoughts? Is that a real there's, thing? I saw that in your there's notes. There's a lot I, of hats. There is an insane I amount of. It. There's a lot of trilobies present throughout the. Uh, <laughs> and detectives. In one too many syllables. Correct. <laughs> there's a lot of fedoras and a lot of detective creature types present across a bunch of random cards. It's just like, here's the new feather. It's feather with the same mechanic, but she has a fedora on now. <laughs> I recorded a gameplay episode of the pre-cons for the Scry Babies that's not going to end up making it into air because of uh, technical issues. Um, But that was my first note when I sat down at the table is looking at all of the commanders and being like, oh, they're all like, you know, the jellyfish monster detective. They're all a detective of some sort. I thought that was really funny. Yeah, I've been I've been deep diving on two of the pre-cons because I'm writing upgrade guides for TCG players. That Demir one is cracked. And uh, uh, the Demir one I'm not looking at, but. Uh, but yeah, they're kind of awesome pre-cons, number one, but also number two, yeah. Everything is just like a detective or everything is... Everything has a hat. Everything is very private sleuthy. <laughs> and if and if people aren't wearing a hat, they're like wearing a, like a banker's vest. I completely miss this. I need to look harder at magic cards. It's like New Capenna without the, the halo drugs, right? <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I was that's, thinking. Yeah. That's a lot of the vibe, for sure. It's like, they're like, yeah, Ravnica's in the 20s now. <laughs> like the 1920s or something. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so uh, it is, it is at the time of this release, it will be pre-release weekend. So go out, um, do some pre-release. And if you're into that, I probably will be because I, be. I love doing pre-release weekends. Um, also uh, happened, the Secret Layer Cats and Dogs pre-constructed Commander deck Secret Layer uh, drop happened, and uh, there was a huge line. People had to wait a long time if they wanted to buy it, and it did sell out. Um, please note, apparently, the Secret Layer Commander decks have always been a limited run product, not a print-to-order product, at least the ones they have done after the coin flip one. <laughs> I think they probably learned their lesson on the coin flip one once everyone had to like wait a year plus to get it in the mail uh but it sold out yeah me too it sold out secret layer cats and dogs with uh adorable anointed procession reprint um i think is like the only notable thing in the entire list sold out but i get why it's you know the Ren basic art is cool There's yeah the double-sided, cat soul ring. the double-sided soul ring is cool the double-sided command tower is cool and i get it it's a it's people love cats or dogs or both so why not you know get a cat and dog deck with a bunch of cute art um it was about 60 dollars too expensive to tempt me though yeah um what was the selling price on it 150 i think that's what the yeah yeah, i believe 150 150. yeah yeah hey at least as a as the foil on both sides they're not going to curl i I have to think about that now because I do have the coin flip one and I can't remember if they curled or not. No, I uh, I can tell you I, I would reach for them if I hadn't just put them away. But I finally like got out my cute to brute 
uh, precon and all of the double sided foils are unreal Pringles. Unfortunately, <laughs> like I could not sleep with the Bummer, deck. I thought play you were right going now. to say the opposite. No, it's it's bad. It's bad. Um, speaking of other bad, um, Secret Lair Winter Super Trop 2024 also announced the only things they've shown off is a Gonti Lord of Luxury, like uh, uh, just is in the advertising in the weird suspect frame from Murder at Karlov Manor, and they also showed off hard boiled thrillers. Another secret layer drop full of magic cards that don't look like magic cards that I personally think are really cool, but I understand why Emma hates them because they're entirely <laughs> illegible as game pieces. But I just think I think it's neat for cards to look like they're the cover <laughs> of a of a hard boiled detective novel. I also understand that they are not legible game pieces. <laughs> Wait, are these the red ones or not the red ones? No, we'll get to the red ones. Okay. These are secret layer cards. It's a it's a secret layer drop where all of the cards, much akin to like the horror movie poster ones. Mm -hmm. It's like the metal the, poster the ones. Was the luck and Liliana and Dismember ages ago? It's basically like that. Yeah, it's like with... those, but rather than like a horror movie poster, it's like, what if it's those really dramatic these detective things. novel covers? <laughs> yes, yeah. Dan, yes. These things. Dan, what does what do you mean? That was a very <laughs> that was a very heavy uh inflection so, in your voice. I have a sort of like a personal history with this style of art and magic because a uh, friend of uh, myself, Alan, from Mental Misplay, uh, a lot of the original artwork that he used to get done for his show was done by uh, a friend of his, uh, Alex Bearded Tales of Woe, uh, I think on Instagram and all of the socials, uh, who would do these really awesome like these, these pulp posters of like uh, different cards like Demonic Consultation and Thassa's Oracle. And there's a few different ones of them. Um, so I think like uh, I don't, it, it struck me as being very funny when I finally saw these. And being like, oh, this is literally what Alex was doing five years ago. Um, but I think they're cool. They are unreadable. Um, I don't know. I would rather see them like on a wall than in play because they're not hard or they're not very easy to understand. But they're cool. I don't know. They're fine. <laughs> Emma, you have the floor. <laughs> Everyone knows what I'm going to think about it. I don't need to say anything. People know. Well, if I if I see this card across me, I'm going to throw it across the room. Simple as that. Like, care to give us the lowdown then on secret layer drop Amsterdam? Oh, God, don't get me started. You don't like the duck? I, the duck is great because okay. it's not red bordered <laughs> and you can actually read what it does. Okay. All right. Uh, no, I stand by you on this one. I like the duck and I don't like the red borders. <laughs> and the, duck's I like a them cool, both. the duck is a cool promo because it's a nod to Amsterdam because yeah. there's lilies and, lilies and it is looks, a very big it is like Holland. a black it's very and white classic. magic card. It's very classic. And it's a, it's a subtle nod which is something WotC should do more of when they have these Pro Tours. They should have location-specific primers. I would be very into that. Yeah. Where um, was the, where was the, like, where was the, the bridge-themed uh, LA one? Doesn't Chicago have, like, a pond with, meant. like, I a turtle Chicago. and a pizza yeah. or something? I don't something know. Something like that. The, is that there's where like the a I don't know. There's a there's a promo for Chicago that's very similar and very specific to Chicago. There are things in the art that is tied to Chicago. But yeah, like the red border cards, I'm just like, it felt like Watsy printed off the cards and they skipped a color and went, actually, this looks great. Let's keep it. And that's why there's this massive red sort of overlay. But if people enjoy it, great. I'm not going to criticize it. It's just, it's very um, loud for me, if that makes sense. Very unique Visually and loud. different, unfortunately. Cal, you enjoy it. You have the floor. I yeah. do enjoy <laughs> them, but I am just like, I am fully pilled on whatever whatever it is. I am all in on the Wacky Magic the Gathering cards. I understand that they're like not very good functional game pieces, but I love to use them as my functional game pieces. Um... And if somebody asks me what the card does, I'll recite it from memory because I'm a boomer that knows what all the cards do. No, oh, that's what everyone who recites the card text <laughs> thinks. They all think they know what it says, but they never and do. And then I look at it and I'm like, wait, Reconnaissance doesn't do what I did. All right. 
that's the end of the product watch and that is also the end of this half of the herald's horn as we transition to my conversation with jim dan or emma do you have any final thoughts before we leave our beloved listeners for the next two weeks emma you first stay hydrated dan uh be nice to yourself and invest in your local library all right thanks for listening that is great it's a really good one hey there if you're enjoying the podcast and want to help both me pay my bills and pay the bills of the co-hosts consider supporting us on patreon for just five dollars a month you can support the content you care about directly officially becoming a trumpeter or whatever the official Harold's Horn fan title ends up being. It's contentious at this time. If you back us, I'll even send you a sticker in the mail. The link is in the podcast's description. All that being said, let's get back into the episode. And we're back with Jim Lepage, James, James, Jim, did I say that right? You did say James, right? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But I, but I didn't say your last name. It's Lepage. 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 We already went over this and I immediately messed it up as soon as I tried to say it for the first time. (laughs) It's like practicing it in the mirror. (laughs) Like Lepage, Lepage. Okay. Now here's Jim Lepage. Oh. (laughs) Oh no. I can't believe I've done this. Well, James, a.k.a. Jim, uh, uh, funny for me to accidentally say James, because I assume that you're actually a James. I am actually like James, James, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, member of the Commander Rules Committee, um, Spike Feeder CEO, question mark. Officially CEO. We incorporated um, in December. I am uh, actually officially oh, the CEO of TSF CEO Entertainment, of- Inc., Nice, yep. nice. I was gonna say LLC Inc. <laughs> what do we What do we got here? We're in, we're in Inc. I love, we're in Inc. I love doing an LLC bit. <laughs> but yes, Jim, thank you for joining me on this episode of the Herald's Horn. Um, you, I said you're a member of the Rules Commander Rules Committee. Um, what does the Commander Rules Committee do, Jim? That's a question that I've been trying to answer for a while. Um, and I think you know that <laughs> based on your reaction. Here. Yes, yes. This is a this is a baited. Yeah, question. there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there. The uh, like uh, on the surface, if you were to ask like Wikipedia or whatever, if there was a Wikipedia article on the Commander Rules Committee, we're in charge of maintaining the rules of the format and the ban list. Uh, we're not a Watsi entity, so uh, because Commander was a fan creative um, project that kind of ballooned into what it is today, uh, all of the decisions on banning, on rules changes, on legality. All of that fun stuff is determined by a group of five people, including myself. Uh, it's me, Gavin Duggan, Toby Elliott, Scott Larrabee, and Olivia Gobert Hicks. Um, that's like the the thirty thousand foot explanation of what the Commander Rules Committee is. Um, now, in terms of what we do, there's quite a bit that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, like the obvious thing is we update the ban list and we update update the rules, but we also uh, review cards that uh, Wizards is in uh, the process of developing. So we deal quite closely with R&D and the casual play design team to review some designs that they've put together before anything's finalized so that we can give them feedback on, um, you know, kind of with our unique blend of expertise, which is how do we see these cards playing out if they hit the table in a game, right? Because it can be really easy to look at a card and say, I think that should cost one more, or uh, this does a little much, or this, you know, interacts poorly with some other card that's in the, you know, commonly played. But it's a little bit different to be like, what's the vibe going to be when this hits the table, you know? Um, because there are a lot of cards that you can look at and you can say, these, this is a fine card, like card like Grave Pact, Right. Uh, or like aura shards or something like that. You're like, wow, this card's really good when you read it. But then when you play it and it kind of sucks the air out of the room, which they often do, that's like a different aspect of card design, which is how do we think this is going to make people feel in practice? So that's one of the things that we do. We uh, interact with R&D. We also, what else do we do? We maintain a Discord that allows people to come and chat with us and each other about the format and the format health and the things that they think uh, should be changed about the format or kept the same. Um, 
Those are, I would say, the big, the big, uh, big ticket items at the moment. Oh, is that all? Yeah. Is that all, Jim? <laughs> yeah. Volunteer organization, by the way. Nobody's getting paid to do this. <laughs> Nobody's getting paid. I know there's been like a lot of talk about that in the past. Like, oh, why isn't the RC paid by wizards? Oh, why doesn't the RC start a Patreon? I guess the RC technically has or had a Patreon. We do. Right? Yeah, we have a Patreon. We have a Twitch. Okay, yeah. uh, we have a Twitch channel um, that we stream on once a week. Uh, it's not always myself, but it's a, a rolling mix of uh, of folks. Um, and a lot of our fundraising efforts go to paying the mods on our server. Uh, we, we actually pay like a not insignificant amount out of pocket to kind of maintain operations like web hosting, paying the mods, um, paying, uh, other Callahan to run our stream. Um, yeah, there, there's like a few, few costs that come up. The, uh, Patreon covers some of it, but not all of it. Uh, and then we've also got some other stuff that we're looking at getting into in 2024, um, like expanding our translation into other languages um which i think is a really good thing uh because commander is not only played in north america and it's not only played in english so um but yeah we have a few things a lot of a lot of things in the a uh, lot of irons in the fire right now yeah that's actually what i wanted to talk to you a little bit about today at least whatever i can uh eke out of yeah. you because um i'm trying to talk about timely things with people on this podcast i'm sure jim that you and i could talk about whatever we wanted to for like an hour and a half or Zelda. whatever. Um, and it might, and it, yeah, exactly. And it would like probably be good TV, but um, I want to talk to you about commander in 2023 commander in 2024 and beyond. And like, like you said, there's, there's all these things the commander rules committee does. Um, I think there's a perception that I, I think is incredibly unfair, uh, both from those deeply invested and those who barely know what the RC is that the RC doesn't exactly do anything, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, which like, I think especially for some of the most invested people could be some holdover from when, you know, a decade ago, the RC did kind of just appear once a quarter and say, ah, the banned cards. At least that was my perception of what the RC did a decade ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, but now you're doing a whole lot. There's a whole lot of irons in the fire. If I'm not mistaken, very soon uh after or even on the day of that this podcast will release the uh commander in review like state of commander article will have dropped how how is commander in 2024 is it healthy is it growing <laughs> well i'm not actually finished the article it comes out in like a week <laughs> as of as of today um i'm not actually finished it and i have to finish I, it like, i get it probably tomorrow I, so that watsy can I was review about to say, it <laughs> i write on average like 1.75 articles a week in addition to my full-time job i yeah, get it yeah <laughs> yeah um yeah the 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 uh short answer is Commander is a whole lot different than it was like 10 years ago. And I think that we need to really confront that head on, what it looks like and what it means. Um, the, the main thing that really sticks out to me when I when I sat down, like to give a little bit of context, this article um, that is going to be going up is something that Sheldon wrote for SCG uh, Star City Games every year in like late January. You know, he'd start it. He'd start writing it in like early January, release it in late January. And uh, Sheldon passed in the summer, obviously, um, or in the, the fall, I guess, late summer. Um, and I thought it was really important to keep the tradition going. It was something that was important to Sheldon to give people a snapshot of where the format was at every year. So that, uh, you know, for posterity, partially, and then also so that to show people that we do know what's going on in the format, that we're not just, you know, locked away in an ivory tower and not playing commander and just talking about it academically. Um, so I wanted to give people a snapshot of... Um, not just what I think of uh, what I think Commander is today in 2024, but uh, what the rest of the Rules Committee does as well. So it's a little bit of a challenge, you know, kind of herding, you know, five cats to agree on what we're actually looking at. Because <laughs> as you know, like five people can look at the same thing and you get five different accounts of what it, it comes is. comes to wildly different conclusions. Yeah. yeah. But if I'm like taking a look at Commander today, um, we're kind of in a little bit of a lull, it almost feels like the eye of a storm because we've gone through like two solid years of constant preview season of, of rapid fire releases of commander formats. And it feels like drinking from a fire hose, right? In that even the most invested players can't 
memorize. They can't have that like encyclopedic knowledge of every card that's ever released, unless you like work at a game store and it's what your full time job is to keep track of these things. Um, like I go to my LGS and I ask them for some cards, and and even some of the folks that it is their full time job, they still have trouble keeping up. So I think it it has um kind of started to die down. It it feels like it started to die down at least. It's definitely a lot different than it was last year at this time. Um, but I would say for the for the bulk of 2023, which is what the article is going to be talking about, we did have those rapid fire releases where you know we'd have a new product coming out you know, every three weeks, it felt like, um, you know, standard sets, supplemental sets, the universe is beyond secret layers, like everything was getting previewed all the time. And a commander precon with everything. Yeah, exactly. And there was like, I don't even know how many commander decks there were in 2023, dozens, right? Because there was like either two or four with every set, with every major set. Every single set. Plus there was the supplemental sets. Plus like there was the, um, uh, the Warhammer ones, I think, were 2023. I don't know. There was, yeah, the the Warhammer ones were within this last year, I think. No, they, I think they might have. They might have been late 2022. 2022. Yeah, but it suffice it to say, there were a lot of products, and that can be. There was, there was at least two Secret Layer Commander uh, decks in the last year. Yeah, too, so. yeah. Just stack. And even on. now, like we've got more coming out, right? We've got this uh, Cats and yep. Dogs one. There's the Fallout one coming up in the spring. All these, there's a lot of products coming out. So it, it, it. Uh, oh, there's the Doctor Who one yes, too. Yes. Yeah. There you yep. go. <laughs> so I think that there's, there's a couple major yeah. impacts of that. Um, and the first, I think, is that I don't see cards. This this is going to be totally anecdotal. I, I don't actually have any data to pack this to back this up because I think it's actually pretty difficult to come up with good solid. It's, data. it's hard to get data about a ostensibly casual, extremely widespread format. Yeah, that is played by a, a, a massive range of levels of investment, et cetera. Yeah, et cetera. It, it feels like outside of um, CDH and in, in sort of the greater casual ecosystem, it feels like each. Um, set and each product release is having a smaller impact on the format as a whole. They're not quite as centralizing. It's not like 10 years ago when it was like cons of Tarkir is out and now every deck is running fetch lands or like, oh, cons of Tarkir had a new Jeskai commander like Shu Yun, right? And then that was like, I, I'm I'm kind of dating myself here. I think Shu Yun was like the eighth Jeskai commander. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So yeah, like it was a exactly. big deal because like yep. it, it was like you only had a couple options and then suddenly a new option comes out and you're like, wow, this is incredible. And now everybody wants to play that commander because it's the new hotness, right? But these days, the frequency of product releases and the the composition of the product releases skewing heavy, heavier towards commander and heavier towards legendary creature design means that instead of getting the eighth Jeskai commander, we're getting like, I don't know how many there are right now, but let's say like the 38th, right? And it's just like, it's a smaller slice of the pie than it used to be. Um, You know, if you were to go back and look, I think there have been something like, I want to say like 300 legendary humans released in the past, like two years, like currently legal and standard. There's something like 300 legal legendary humans. So it's just like people have more options. And so it seems to me like each one is a little less centralizing than it, than it, uh, than it has been in the past. Um, now, obviously, there's still outliers where, you know, there are clear best commanders that come out in a set and everybody seems to flock to those or like really maybe not best commanders, but most attractive ones. Like when people built. Uh, yeah, most popular for one reason. Yeah. Like when people built uh, Multani and Yargle. Was it Yargle and Multani? Yeah. It was just because it was like. Just because it's like yeah, funny. Yeah, this was like funny. Everybody yeah. loved the meme. And and, yep. and it was like, I think for a while there, it was like the third most popular card in that set. <laughs> um, <laughs> just because it was like a big dumb guy. Yeah, and this like stuff like they're like, oh, we finally made the curses commander, yeah, or the shrines commander. So then everyone goes, oh, perfect, I can finally make my shrines deck. And then that's at least a little bit of a a little bit of a focus that people can focus. Yeah, on. like but, when I talk to the folks in, that I talk to in casual play design, one of their uh, I don't want to talk for them, but one of the things that mm-hmm. they've told me in the past is that um, they love niche powerful things. So if something is powerful in a very specific context, that's preferable to something being just good stuff. Yep. Right. Like, you know, like Ancestral Recall, that's just like, 
that card is it is like <laughs> probably the best blue card that you'll ever put in one of your decks, right? It's it's really 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 good. But if it's something like ah, oh, you have to sacrifice a tapped merfolk or whatever, and then it's ancestral recall, like that's great design, right? Maybe yeah. I, that's that maybe not great design, but it's it's a it's powerful in a very specific circumstance, right? So it means it's gonna it's gonna go in fewer decks, but it'll be better on average in the decks that it goes in. And that's that's I think what uh, what uh, they're shooting for most of the time. So on the one hand, you've got like probably unprecedented diversity. And again, I, I don't have the numbers to back that up. So you know, get in the comments and yell at me or whatever. But it also has a weird side effect of making people feel like new players. Like I know even I when I sit down at, at a game at my LGS, somebody plays a card and I'm like, I don't know what that does. <laughs> like, I've never heard of this card yeah, can before. I, can I read yeah. that? We've got a reader. Yeah, right. It used to be like, it used to be like, yeah, I, I think that decks used to run a higher concentration of the same core of cards. It, it's almost like when you're playing CDH where you're like, I'm going to play an offer you can't refuse. And everybody knows at the table what that card does. Immediately right? knows what it does. Yeah, and like sure. in, in the casual um, context, that was like, I'm going to play Solemn Simulacrum or Cabal Coffers or Sakura Tribe Elder. Or like there were these like super, super staple cards, Eternal Witness. Um, that went in a lot of decks. And so even though the cards look different, I think there's a lot more variety that you're seeing on average, even when people play fairly powerful decks. Um, just the the number of cards coming out means that like people don't end up at the same conclusion when they look at the same set of cards, right? <laughs> it's because there's so many more cards and... Of so many of the new cards, there's a lot of niche, powerful design. Yeah, and I, I know even I found that I have to go back a couple years and look at sets because they were being released so frequently that I would like make you a just miss entire sets. Yeah, I'd like jot yeah. down a couple notes of cards that I wanted to pick up for a set, and then there would be previews for the next set, <laughs> and you're kind of distracted by the shiny thing, and and uh, you forget to pick them up. But yeah, I don't know. It's it's kind of a weird feeling. It's it's definitely a lot of diversity. Um, not all of it is good, I don't think, because again, without without relying on data here, it feels like a lot of the popular cards in Commander are cards that were designed specifically for Commander and aimed at Commander. So it almost feels like the Modern Horizons um, problem, depending on whether you consider that a problem, where it kind of quasi yeah, like, rotates an eternal format. I would I would say that. In my time playing Commander, which granted has been over a decade now, I would say it is practically an entirely rotated format and not by a natural rate. It felt it used to feel with, you know, standard sets and the annual Commander release, which would, you know, speed things up a little bit because there'd be cool new cards and cool new specifically built legendaries to build around. That would push it a little bit. But when all the only ever inserts into the format beyond the annual commander precons were just the uh when it was just the standard sets you'd get you know if you had 10 commander decks you'd look at a standard set and you'd say ah one new card yeah. that i absolutely need for my 10 commander decks yep. and that was the situation for everyone where now every three months you could say oh i need 40 new cards for my 10 commander or decks. you find a new deck you want to build and then you need 100 new exactly. cards right and then exactly and then you have 20 commander yeah. decks yep <laughs> yeah exactly and it but it and i like i like that way of describing it as like almost a rotated format because yeah over the last i think the last it, it has become less of a cohesive experience maybe it feels like to me, the last thing that commander players as a body, at least, you know, invested commanders that I'm aware of, of uh, invested players that I'm aware of what they do, like the last thing that everyone was talking about cohesively was the Eldrain Brawl pre-constructed mm -hmm. decks. And then, and or maybe the Strixhaven commander decks. And then after that, like, it was just like pedal to the floor. Yeah. Craziness. Yep. Nobody can focus on anything, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so like, I don't know, it, in, in a sense, it's good. I like, I think it, it yeah, seems to me exactly. like it's, it's fairly neutral. Like, I'm not sure that I would mm -hmm. classify it as wholly good sure. or wholly bad. There are some good elements and there's some bad elements. Um, I think that commander might be, might be losing something a little bit. It makes me a little bit nervous 
in that I'm seeing fewer old weird cards pop up. Um, Outside of the ones where, you know, you know how like, you know, a card like Marchesa, the original Marchesa comes out and suddenly unspeakable symbol becomes like a $20 card because it's like clearly one of the best things that you can do in that deck. One of the most effective things you can do in that deck outside of those cards where they're like the first best thing that you can do in a new commander. It seems like we have fewer cards popping up that are like Thorn Mammoth and things like that, where they're just like weird old cards um, it seemed like 10 years ago, and this could be a personal thing, I, I think I saw more of those 10 years ago, even though they were kind of slotted in between these ultra-staple casual cards like Solemn Simulacrum and Eternal Witness. Um, and it seems like I'm seeing fewer of those. That could just be because maybe a lot of them are reserve list and they're less accessible than like standard cards these days. But it does seem like I'm seeing fewer hidden gems and more diverse decks that are composed almost entirely of newer cards, like from the last three to four years. I have to imagine part of that, though, is the average length of playing Magic the Gathering for the average commander player has probably rapidly shortened over the last oh, three yeah. to five years. Oh, I well. would 100% say that. Yeah. Commander... Um, I think experienced a really huge boom, like both with the the decline of pro play over the same period of time. I think that a lot of um, pro players and former pro players started to look at commander and say, this is like the way that I can get a, a consistent commander game with people in my community um, or the a consistent magic game rather. Um, and they kind of, <laughs> I, I do find it kind of funny because Sorry, I shouldn't say I find it funny. I don't find it funny, the, the decline of pro play. Don't don't quote me on that. Um, but I do find it... All right, I'm yeah, clipping clip, this for YouTube that. shorts right now. Comments, Commander <laughs> RC member says... No, okay. Um, but I do... Years ago, when I was buying my Commander decks, you know, at this is like maybe eight, nine years ago, um, the folks that were in the store to play Standard and Modern, and they were stuck behind me buying 80 singleton cards... <laughs> <laughs> um, would be like actually making fun of me for playing Commander. They'd be like, "Oh, Commander's not even mm -hmm. Magic. It's like a game that's based on Magic, or it's a game that's you uh, that's that's played using Magic pieces." You know? Yeah, it's like a board game, yeah, multiplayer board game that happens to use the Magic. Yeah, it's like Magic game. fan yeah. fiction, right? It's not canon, <laughs> 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 but it it obviously strikes a chord with a lot of people. But I think that there's been a huge influx of folks that uh, you know previously played more competitive formats. They're reaching out to other fandoms. That's, you know, like them, like them or hate them, the universe is beyond stuff does bring in people from other fandoms at a wild rate. Um, folks that are maybe magic adjacent, you know, folks that are in like <laughs> the Warhammer crossover was like that Venn diagram is like pretty close to being a circle. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a lot of magic players are at least aware of and maybe somewhat interested in, you know, tabletop. The things. other egregiously expensive right. time consuming life consuming yeah hobby. right <laughs> um yeah. or you know there are all of these magic magic adjacent things like D, &D is one of those things like um I, I think that these crossovers are bringing in a not insignificant amount of people that are interested in those things and maybe magic curious you know um but yeah I, magic is or commander is in a, a different universe than it was like five years ago even mm -hmm. Um, that makes sense. So we're, we, we've got commander in 2023 slash 2024. It's definitely more varied, which is like a neutral thing. Ostensibly, It's good for some reasons, maybe losing a little bit of a specific sheen that it used to have as a result per se. What, what else is going on with Commander? Is there anything else in this article, Jim? Yeah. like the, the It's in the unfinished yeah, article. The article itself, <laughs> it, it kind of has a thread throughout of yeah. transition. Um, so this is less mm -hmm. about the gameplay, like how does Commander play For in sure. 2023, 2024, and a lot but more, more about, about changes yes, in philosophy. Structure yeah. and um, yeah, a little bit on philosophy, but mostly changes in structure. Um Mm -hmm. it's it's been really tough um uh you know not not filling the holes that sheldon left but um mm -hmm. kind of dealing with his absence you know mm -hmm. uh sheldon did a lot of work for the rules committee both in messaging and in just like behind the scenes actually doing work um and so now 
you know, just instead of six people working on the stuff, we now have five, you know, uh, in addition to a lot of things like, uh, state management and all that kind of thing, like, you know, the, uh, rules committee, Patreon was going through his accounts. And so we had to deal with his estate and get it all transferred over to different people. And so like, there's a lot of, um, continuity planning stuff that we were starting to do, uh, last year. And unfortunately we kind of just ran out of runway on getting a lot of it done, but we're, uh, kind of dealing with this as, you know, a lesson learned and that we have to get better at, uh, both, you know, <laughs> preparing for people leaving, whether it's on good terms or bad terms or otherwise, um, we have to get better at at just making sure that things um, continue without too many interruptions if somebody needs to leave or somebody wants to leave. Uh, one of the main things that we're doing is uh, we are setting up a 501c3. Uh, so the, um, for non-Americans, I'm a non-American, but that's a nonprofit <laughs> organization uh, designation for um, incorporated companies. Um, so we are setting up an organization, uh, a nonprofit for the rules committee for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is so that the organization exists independent of any of the individual members. That's the first thing. And the second thing is increased transparency. Um, because one thing that I feel really strongly about is that if we're taking anybody's money that I want them to know where the money's going. Uh, so with, with the 501c3 designation, there's increased oversight, increased transparency on where the money's going. Um, so that you know that if you're signing up for our Patreon, that we're not just stuffing it into our pockets, right? Um, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing is uh, we're doing a lot of documentation. Um, one thing that we'll be announcing in the article and that I'm finalizing right now is uh, putting up an explanation of why every card on the ban list is banned. Uh, so this is like a legitimate first party source uh, to say, Hey, for each card that's on the ban list, you should be able to mouse over it. I'm not sure if the mouse over is going to work on day one, but we'll see. We have our top minds on it. <laughs> I'm not an expert on this stuff. Come on. Come on, Gavin. If Hurry we can't figure yeah, it's exactly it. If we can't figure that yes. out, I'll just toss them in accordion <laughs> menus or something a little uglier until we get it figured yeah, out. Yeah, but yeah. it'll be up there. <laughs> uh, yep. But the idea is if you're researching the ban list, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to come up with a first party source from the rules committee to say this is the official reason why it's banned. Yeah, us, the people who ban yeah. the card and every quarter go, ah, what of these things should be banned, if anything? Here's why it's still yeah, banned. Like we, yeah, like we have this weird game of telephone <laughs> going where there are like articles and forum posts from 15 years ago on why a card was banned. And then that gets filtered through a thousand people. And then now suddenly people are talking about reasons that have never been the reason why a card was banned as though it's, you know, gospel. And, you know, there are obviously some concerns that, you know, people may not like the reasons why they're banned, but I would rather people get upset over the real reason than a reason that somebody made up. Yeah. So, rather than like a reason that they made up. Yeah. Like if you want to get mad at me, that's cool. Like I'm, I'm used to it, but uh, I would rather you get mad at me for something I said than something I didn't say. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's going up. What everyone doesn't know is that this, the work was very quick. Jim took every card and then put a colon and then said, Sheldon and his play group did not like losing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that one was kind of tough because uh, we had to go through each card. There's like 40, 40 something cards on the ban list and we had to go through each card and it, it was kind of as much exploratory as it was explanatory because I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't know all of the reasons why every card was banned. The, the official first party reason, um, you know, I know the discussions that I've had in the past uh, I have a general idea of what the ban list is for, um, but, you know, I wasn't on the rules committee when a lot of these cards were banned. In fact, I haven't been on the rules committee when any cards were banned. So, you know, I don't know what the discussions were behind the scenes or anything like that. So it was kind of a collaborative process of the five of us and a few members of the CAG, the commander advisory group, to say, okay, first party, what is the the main reason why this card was banned? And these are not going to be 2000 word articles on why each card was banned, right? They're intended to be like three sentences. What is the top line reason? Like we're not getting into the nitty gritty. A lot of these cards, there's a lot of nuance and stuff like that, but we wanted somebody who knew how to play magic, but wasn't a 20 year veteran of MTG Nexus forums or MTG salvation to be able to go in and at least have some concept of the real reason why these things were banned. So you know, we lose a little bit in brevity, but I think we gain a lot in accessibility. Um, 
Yeah, so it was kind of a, a process of me learning some of the reasons why these cards are banned, and we actually kind of came up with a bunch of cool little fun facts. I'm not sure what we're going to do with them yet, but um, like one thing that I didn't know was that Areo was banned for being basically the first uh, commander to spike what was at the time competitive EDH tournaments, like when it was banned. <laughs> okay so we have had two cards in the history yeah. <laughs> of edh banned for competitive so it management. was like if you actually go back and look at the forum posts originally for it it was because people were spiking mm. tournaments with it and beyond that people were colluding with it i don't even know what that card does it uh, counters the first spell each person casts each turn once it's flipped it's a it's a kamigawa flip card oh yes that's the blue yeah. flip card yep, yep 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 okay and uh yeah so and also that card's just miserable yeah, it is miserable <laughs> I just assumed it was on the ban list because that's one of the most miserable cards I can imagine yeah. in a command. But yeah, game. and like that ostensibly, that is the reason um, why it was banned. Yeah. But also there's some cool lore with it that um, like it, it was spiking CEDH tournaments at the time, whatever that looked like. And it mm. and people were colluding big time. Like they were dealing with the collusion. That's hilarious. Issue. Um, so I don't quite know what we're going to do with those. I, I'm like, keep, I'm, I'm yep. jotting them down. Cause I think that these stories are really interesting to tell, um, to give people a little bit of a history of the format. Maybe I'll talk to Sam from Mystic always, Studies. You could always write, you could always write another article. Yeah. Talk to Sam. yeah exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, my reach isn't quite as far as what Sam's is, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll put up like a pop-up video or something like that where, you know, little, little fun facts on each commander pop up, you know? Mm -hmm. That's, that's fun. That's neat. So you have the you have the 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 direction of commander coming. You've got these the bandless reasoning coming. I I wanted to touch back on this. You're doing translation of a lot of your existing documents into other languages. Yeah, it's something that so our, our website right now. Um, there's a little small button in the in the lower left hand corner. Um, it may be it probably won't be changed by the time this comes out, but um, where you can translate each page into a different language. Uh, that is done by like it's done automatically. There's no human involved in that translation. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the Google Translate services. Yeah, they have plugins <clears> for. Stuff but that like, doesn't yeah. really help us for a few things. Like number one, there's like a fair bit of nuance involved in in all of these documents, and I want to make sure that that comes through clearly in the translation. That does require human eyes to look at it. Uh, and then uh, additionally, our announcement stuff, where we might toss it out on social media or whatever. If we have a tweet or something like that that goes out, we want to make sure that it says the right thing in other languages and that it's not just default Google Translate that might pick the wrong word and insult a bunch of people inadvertently. Yeah, exactly. So and I think that it's also an important step to show people that don't live in North America, don't live in the US, Canada, or or you know any other predominantly English-speaking countries that we're like thinking about them, that we're talking to folks from their region. Um, and that we're getting the pulse of, of what Commander is like for them, you know, because Commander looks really different when you play it in other places. If you go to Japan or you go to China or you go to Brazil, um, all of these places have these like not insular, but different Commander scenes that kind of evolve on their own. And they can be influenced by different things like accessibility of product, like Brazil, their postal system is kind of a nightmare if you've ever tried to ship anything to brazil it's it's kind of awful <laughs> and they have a really hard time getting product in and that was like one of the major concerns when when um secret layers started coming out is that they were like well i don't know if i can get this product i don't even know if you can ship it to me you know uh and so their their kind of uh their metagames kind of evolve a little bit differently based on all of these different um influences and pressures and so you know the keg is is one of the ways that we deal with that, but we would love to touch base with people to make sure that what we're saying really resonates with the folks that are from those places as well. Um, so that's something that we really care about. Obviously, that's something that costs money. We don't expect people to do work for us for free. But uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that's high up on our list. Uh, we want to make sure, first of all, that our messaging is getting to the right people in the, in the right language. And uh, also that we're identifying commander luminaries from around the world and not just from our local communities uh, to help us run the format and to see if people are interested in leading the format that they can, you know, join us and, and contribute their thoughts because there are obviously brilliant people everywhere.
that makes a lot of sense in the in that vein too of communication and stuff um do you have any plans going on to further increase i know you want to increase transparency around the um say the the money side of things with the the 501c3 and that kind of stuff um do you have any plans going on and, and obviously with the you know the communication the translation that's huge getting more people involved that's huge with that too do you have um more plans concerning communicating more information to people about what the rc has going on and stuff because i know i've i i know that you have these projects going on and i know some other people know these projects going on but there's there's like a lot of people that won't know about these things until january 31st say or whatever when this article drops and there's a lot maybe other projects or things that the rc is doing that people won't know about until yeah x date are you guys interested in like talking about that publicly more? Yeah, or? I kind of got a hedge a little bit. I was really hoping to have more to say about those things by the end of 2023. For sure. Um, they've kind of got pushed because we prioritized the ban list explanation project because I think that that's more important. Yeah, we sick. get more out of it than than this more academic yeah. stuff. But the one question, you know, you kind of asked at the beginning, what does the Rules Committee do? And like, I'm not, not exaggerating when I say that. I think about that a lot. Um. I more what what is my job? Yeah, more specifically, I really care about the question. <laughs> this is like when when Prof interviewed Sheldon. Uh, Prof messaged me and said, mm -hmm. "What are some what are some questions that I can ask Sheldon? I really want to hold his feet to the fire in this interview." <laughs> and uh, I said, "Well, you know, the question that I have been asking for years, and I still don't feel like I have an adequate explanation of it, is how do we know whether we're doing a good job?" And it is an open ended question. I, I don't. I'm not married to any metrics or KPIs or, or anything that like, I, I don't have my own definition that I'm, that I'm looking to impose on anybody, but I would love to sit back and say, these are all the things that we do. These are all the things that we care about. So how do we know whether the things that we're doing are going to improve the things that we care about or maintain the things that we care about? And so um, I'm, I'm, I've been doing a lot of work to try and formalize that. Sheldon actually hinted at it in the last State of the Format article in 2023. Sheldon and I co-wrote that article, and that was um, right around the time that I got added to the Rules Committee. It was maybe we were writing it before, and it got published after, I believe. And um, <clears throat> I really want to, uh, I want to take a step back and structure the things that we care about so that we can center them in everything that we do so that we can say, we're not just making decisions, you know, wildly and hoping that they pan out. We're making them with intention, with a way to determine, you know, looking back on it, I want to be able to determine, was that a good decision or not? Right. Cause that's how you improve is, is by looking back at the decisions you made and, and determining whether or not they had the, the impact that you wanted them to have. So, you know, that's um, kind of something that I don't think that there was a whole lot of in the rules committee. Uh, there, there's still the Sheldon always said that the, the format managing the format is a little more of an art than a science. And I think that there's a time and a place for that. Um, but my main concern is that it can be very difficult to teach somebody to do art the way that you do art, right? Um, they can they can kind of mimic what you do, but it's never going to be what you do, right? Um, whereas with science, the the whole idea behind science is that it's repeatable, right? Is that it's it, yeah that things repeatable. are documented, oh. yeah. that um, the results are repeatable. So you know, I tend to land a little bit more on the science side of the line. I would like things to be repeatable and documented. Um, at least insofar as we can agree on a uh, on a set of facts, right? Like what you and I did at the beginning of this podcast, where we said, "What does the format look like?" And I said, "This is what I see." Right? If we can't agree on what the format is, then we can't even then we're not going to be able to agree on what a good decision is in terms of managing it, right? Or what good good goals would be. So, the the problem with taking on a project like this of, of documenting all this stuff is centering the things that we care about first is the most important thing because everything else is downstream of that. Like the, the decisions that we make, the people that we bring on to help with it, um, the initiatives, the things that we talk about, 
all of that doesn't matter unless we can agree on what the things we care about are, the, the guiding principles of the format or the vision statement, things like that. That's why you see a lot of these companies will start with a vision statement and then everything kind of flows from the vision statement, right? Um, so I would love to get Commander in a place, and I've done a substantial amount of work to this end of um, centering our guiding principles, of coming up with a list of the strategies, uh, like the tools that are in our toolbox to help us maintain and improve the format uh, in terms of the things that we care about, and then uh, also document our past decisions uh, through that lens to say, you know, we banned this card because it interacts poorly with X, Y, and Z, and we um, uh, we don't want it to interact poorly with those things because one of our guiding principles is B, you know? Um, like, you know, we could say like, uh, what's a good example? What did we ban recently? Hull Breacher. Hull Breacher is, uh, it was maybe somewhat controversial, but I think looking back on it was a fairly popular ban. Um, so we might say, you know, Commander is intended to be a social format. Uh, it can be really tough to play a game socially when a card completely locks you out of the game, right? It's got a low colored mana investment, meaning it can come down early in the game. It uh, interacts with wheels and it allows people to, strip, to kind of weaponize its effect to strip people's hands and leave them with essentially no agency in the game, right? So we can look at Hull Breacher through the lens of how does it interact with the things that we care about, which is sociality in games. And we can say it detracted from that, so it had to go, right? So what I'm hoping is that by centering those principles, talking about the tools that we have to address them, then our communication kind of follows from that. And we can say, we did this because this is one of the strategies we have. And then this is the piece of the thing that we care about that it was detracting from uh, as sort of a template for communication. Um, so that's like my pie in the sky vision for things. Um, but it's a lot of work. Well, because... <laughs> In, in in like to the the art versus science thing, like you like you said, it, it is a lot harder to replicate an art than it is to replicate a science. And I think it has been pretty easy for the management of Commander to be more akin to an art in the past because, not to boil it down, but to kind of boil it down, for the longest time it kind of was like Sheldon and like minded friends, like minded in many ways surrounding the format, doing their thing, whatever that thing was. And when it's that level of continuity for the, the 15 years plus or whatever it's been now, it is, a lot, it is a lot easier to be a little more like, well, yes, we do this way because, well, that is the way that we do things. <laughs> it, is, it is an art. But now, um, you know, the, the, the people that many people rightfully call, you know, the godfather, progenitor, et cetera, et cetera, the format um, has passed. And now that is... Um, there's a there's a massive gap there to be filled one way or the other. And, you know, Gavin, Toby, Scott are not going to be around forever. I'm sure a time will come where you or Olivia or both or whatever will say, you know, this was really nice. I've enjoyed doing this. Um, I have a whole rest of my life to live, so I'm going to move on. And with something this big, you can't just have a gargantuan sea change. There has to be some way to have solid continuity and having actual guidelines does help with that quite a lot. Yeah. And like Sheldon and I talked about this quite a bit, uh, you know, over the last two mm -hmm. years or so. So I, I do know this is something that yeah. weighed on him. Yeah. And so like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to scare people. I don't want people to think that, you know, commander is going to be, you know, uprooted and, 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 uh, at the at the and at the end of the article, Jim is quitting. Yeah. Jim is done with the RC. Like I don't want people to think that like I'm <laughs> going to come in and make a whole bunch of changes. Because first of all, I I can't make yep. changes unilaterally. There are five people on the committee, yep. and if four of them don't like what I'm doing, then they don't happen. So um, mm -hmm. that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, this is not new to the concept of the rules committee. Um, I talked about this in my interview when they brought me on to the rules committee. That this is something that I wanted to happen. Um. So this is not... Yeah, because you've been asking these questions for as long as I've known. Oh, yeah. So, this is like the first question... Which is not a short period of time no, at this no. point No, like I, I got in touch with the Rules Committee in 2019 after um, Protean Hulk was unbanned. And it, I was just like, angry hey, tweeting why? at Sheldon. That, that was how I got in touch with the Rules Committee. <laughs> I literally tagged Sheldon That's how most people have ended up in touch. I didn't even... That was before I even had my own Twitter account. I was tweeting at him from oh. the Spike Feeders Twitter account. <laughs> 
and uh, yeah, so I mean, like, I'm I'm not, um, you know, I'm not one of the the old guys club kind of thing, you know. Like, I I met Sheldon for the first time in Vegas in twenty twenty one, I think, or no. There was none in 2021. It would have been 2022. It was very recently. I hadn't met Sheldon in person um, for a long time. It was after I was on the CAG. Um, maybe shortly after I was on the rules committee. <laughs> it was very, very recently anyway. Um, but I'm definitely not, you know, I, I mean, I consider them friends, but I'm not part of that friend group. That's not where I came from, you know. Um, I wasn't part of Sheldon's play group before we played on the commander rules committee stream, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't want people to think that I'm going to come in and, you know, shake the box around and, and, and jostle everything around, but I, I'm mostly looking to observe what I see and get it down on paper so that the people that are making decisions in this format, 10 or 15 years from now, understand the decisions that we're making today so that they can make better informed decisions. Um, because if if Commander is still around in 30 years, um, we may not have even met the people that will be running it. So uh, mm -hmm. we kind of got to operate oh, with sure. them in mind. Yeah, that is awesome. And I think a very solid goal. Um, and I am happy that you are working toward it. In that vein, Jim, I have one more question Hit for me. you. Um, you. You did allude to to just a few just a few minutes ago you alluded to the fact that you joined the the rc around the end of 2022 ish um as one of the first two people added to the, the rules committee in a very long time are you happy with your work in the first full year um on the rules committee i wish we had accomplished more um, uh, obviously yeah. there was uh, one notable major disruption that, that kind of really yeah, derailed sure. things, uh, in the fall. Certainly. Obviously I, I'm not putting these things on the same level. Obviously it's way more important that Sheldon's life, um, was cut short and that, you know, it's got impacts to his family, his friends and everything like that. Um, but there was a lot of work around that and, and I wish we had done more. I think it's, it's, uh, relatively understandable that, um, some of these things got delayed by a few months. Um, oh, for sure. It's astounding. They only got delayed by a few months. Yeah. Now. Right. It, that's actually, I'll say. Yeah. It. And so I'm yeah. hoping that a lot of these things will you'll really be able to start seeing them in 2024. Um, you know, uh, I'm hoping that I personally can do a little bit more. <laughs> this, a lot of these things overlapped with uh, particularly busy periods for me in running the spike feeders. Um, but I'm offloading a lot of that now. We've got a full-time editor and that is helping me a lot <laughs> by freeing up about... Yeah, now that you're not the full-time editor of the Yeah, Spike uh, listeners at home, Cal has been trying to get me on uh, the podcast, uh, the Playing With Power podcast, and now this one uh, for actual literal years. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so long. That's when I was looking for guests for the Playing With Power podcast, yes. something I haven't been involved with for nearly eight yeah. months now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, my schedule has yeah. now finally opened up enough that I can uh, do yep. some things that I've wanted to do in the past year. So um, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's kind of tough. It's um, definitely not the only thing that I do because uh, I also have a full time job, forty hours a week, um, and I'm also running a relatively a large YouTube channel that demands a lot of my time. Uh, and this is kind of on top of that. Uh, I really wish that we had gotten more done and I'm hoping that we can get more done in 2024. Um, but what I'm hoping is that these, um, these, uh, state of the format articles are going to be a bit of a roadmap. So you'll notice that there's a little bit of a narrative structural change in these things where we say, here's a snapshot of the format. This is the way that I see things today. Here are the things that we accomplished. And then looking forward to the next year, this is what we want to do. So we want to shift the narrative away from talking about the format to talking about what we are doing. And uh, part of that is to address um, uh, the concerns that I think a lot of people rightfully have is that they don't see a lot from us, right? They don't see us mm -hmm. reviewing every standard set. They're, they don't see R&D sending us a list of 300 and something cards, every standard set to review and give them detailed feedback on, right? Um, that's like hours and hours of yeah, work. Yeah, there is... there. 
there has historically been a lot of the RC does a lot. Well, what is that? Yeah. A lot? What, what can we see? Uh, it's yeah. a lot. <laughs> and yeah. so, yeah. so I want people to know what it is that we do and I want people to be able to follow along with, with the work that we're doing. So, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm hesitant to, to commit to exact dates on things. Cause we all know, you know, people make plans and they don't always pan out, but, um, what you will see from this article, at least, is a snapshot of the, what the, where the format's at, what we did this past year, and what we plan on doing in the upcoming year. You know, that's about all I think I could personally ask for from you, Jim, and I appreciate it. Is there anything else that people got to know? No, I don't think so. Um, I just hope that people are having fun playing Commander. I like one of the things that you can you can kind of look at people talking about Commander online and think that only people who hate Commander play Commander. <laughs> but you oh, can yeah. go and play oh, Commander. Yeah. We all hate we all hate Commander. You can go yeah. and like play Commander in the <laughs> wild and find out that like people are really cool and fun to play with if you like open your mind up and and you know let yourself have fun playing Magic. Um, like I think I'm not sure who originally said it, but the best cure for talking for talking about magic is playing magic. And I, is and I think magic. that that yeah. is so, so true because like you can spend your time just like seething on Twitter or you can just like go and have fun with your friends. <laughs> yeah, you can just go. Yeah, have fun. I spent a lot of time seething about CDH and then I went and played CDH all day yesterday and I'm the highest on CDH I've been. In yeah. And I think time. that there's a reason why people have these like highs <laughs> after big conventions like that is just because it's like really heartwarming to see like 10,000 people get together all about the same hobby. It's a really cool and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and different experience to say, to look around at one of these cons and be like, wow, all these people are here is because they love magic, you know? So as always, the message listener is, uh, Instead of thinking about magic, just play more magic. Yeah. Just yeah. Just do it. All right. Thanks for joining <laughs> Thanks me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Herald's Horn. If you liked what you heard, consider giving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you really enjoyed listening, you can support us directly on Patreon. I'll even send you a sticker in the mail. Every little bit helps us make the best podcast we can for you. Check out the link in the podcast description. Harold's Horn is hosted, edited, and produced by me, Cal Jones. The co-hosts are Emma Partlow, Lexi, better known as Black Girl Mage, and Dan, better known as Moderately Anonymous MTG. All of our info also lives in the podcast description. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Harold's Horn and any place else you can find us too. If you want to reach out to me about the podcast, hit up editorial at heraldshorn.com. I'd love to see your email. Thanks again for listening to the Herald's Horn. We're having so much fun creating it. See you in two weeks. <laughs>